Well, hello, everyone. I think we'll get started. Um, thank you for being on the call today. My name is Jillian McConnell, and I am the Knowledge Broker with Brain Exchange. And the webinar we are proud to be hosting today is part of a knowledge dissemination series offered in partnership by the Brain Exchange and the Alzheimer's Society of Canada and the Canadian Consortium on Neurodegeneration and Aging, which is also known as the CCNA. So I always say this, so my apologies to those who have participated in these webinars before. But in case we have anyone new on the line that hasn't taken part in these events, taken part um, with these events, um, I do want to provide a quick review to ensure that everyone is comfortable with the technology. So the audio is provided over the phone, which means if you're hearing my voice, you're in the right place. And the visuals or slides are provided by the online link that you would have received in the connection details. On the left-hand side of your screen, you'll see the chat pod, and that's where you can communicate with me during the presentation, and also where you can send me your questions during the Q&A portion. As per usual, all participants' lines are muted for the time being, and that just helps us minimize any background noise or private conversations that you may be having on the side regarding the talk. If you need to ask a question or have a concern during the actual presentation, then please use the chat pod as we won't be able to hear you. So the presentation itself is being recorded. Within a week or so, it will be up on the Brain Exchange website, usually before then. And we encourage you to pass the link on to any colleagues who weren't able to join us for today. So for the purposes of this afternoon, that's really all that you have to be concerned about. The webinar is scheduled to be 60 minutes in length, and our presenters will speak for about 40 minutes or so. And uh, then we'll have 20 minutes at the end for Q&A and discussion. I do ask that people refrain from um, asking questions uh, in the chat pod uh, prior to the discussion period, unless, of course, it's technology related, and then I'll uh, do my best to help you out as soon as I can. So the title of today's session is When Dementia and Abuse Issues Collide, Untangling a Wicked Combination. And our, it's featuring our presenters, Dr. Samir Sinha and Annie, Anna excuse me, uh, Cicillano. And Dr. Sinha is a passionate and respected advocate for the needs of older adults. He currently serves as the Director of Geriatrics at Mount Sinai and the University Health, Health Network Hospitals in Toronto, and was recently appointed the Peter and Sheila Godso Chair in Geriatrics at Mount Sinai Hospital. He is also an assistant professor in the Department of Medicine, Family and Community Medicine, and the Institute of Health Policy Management and Evaluation at the University of Toronto, and an assistant professor of medicine at John Hopkins University School of Medicine. Dr. Sinha's breadth of international training and ex expertise in health policy and the delivery of services related to the care of the elderly has made him a highly regarded expert in the care of older adults. In 2012, he was appointed by the Government of Ontario to serve as the expert lead on, of Ontario's senior strategy, and he is now working on the development of a national senior strategy. In 2014, Canada's Maclean's Magazine proclaimed him to be one of Canada's 50 most influence, influential people and its most compelling voice for the elderly. Anna Cicillano is a registered social worker with the Ontario College of Social Workers and Social Service Workers. Anna's previous clinical experience includes her role as a child protection worker and family service worker at the Children's Aid Society of Toronto. She commenced employment at Circle of Care as a social worker in 2011 and in February 2016 was seconded to the Independence at Home Community Outreach Team as the team's care navigator and social worker. And his current work experience includes her role as a relief shelter counselor with the Yellow Brick House, a women's shelter in York Region that provides support to women and children fleeing domestic violence, and with the Ministry of the Attorney General Mandatory Information Program as a mental health presenter. And is also a member of the North York Elder Abuse Network and a member of the Elder Abuse Steering Committee at Circle of Care. She is also active in gala planning initiatives to help support the Hospital for Sick Children or Sick Kids Foundation. So I uh, turn the, the floor over to you, to our presenters, to Dr. Sinha and uh, Ms. Cicillano, or if uh, you're available, off we go. We seem to be having problems hearing you. Again, to unmute your line would be to press star 7, Anna and Phoebe and Dr. Sinha. Hello. Is that working well? 
Yes, here we are. Welcome. Excellent. Okay, great. So we're, we're excited to be here. Um, it's Samir and Anna, and uh, we will get right underway. So uh, we prepared a presentation for you today. We have a few case studies as well, and then we're keen to get the conversation going as well. So we hope you enjoy our presentation. Because we know we have a diverse audience online today, we have over 150 people who are tuning in via audio on the web, we're going to do a good overview of issues around dementia, but also issues around elder abuse, and then really give you some case studies where we're trying to bring in some of the examples of how these things can kind of collide, and maybe some, some learnings collectively on how we can better uh, manage through these. So first of all, in terms of many people know that our population is aging, and the key is that over the next 20 years, um, the number of older people in Canada is going to double, while the number of people 85 and older is set to quadruple. And we know that the number of Canadians expected to be living with dementia is expected to at least double in the coming decades as well, primarily because we're going to have more older people and more people living into longer or older age groups where dementia tends to be more common. So when we think about ageism and elder abuse in Canada, it's actually really common. Now, there haven't been too many studies that have actually looked at the prevalence because a lot of elder abuse issues go underreported in our country. But for the data that we do have, for example, we know anywhere between 4 to 10 percent of older adults in Canada will experience one or more forms of abuse at some point during their later years. And we know that in Ontario, where they say that they know for sure that 4 percent or 75,000 older on, of, of Ontario's 2 million older adults are reported to be living with elder abuse, you imagine if it's closer to 10%, which is where people think the actual number stands, we're talking about in Ontario alone, that's 200,000 older adults, and across Canada, that would be 500,000 older adults of our 5 million older Canadians. So this is not a small issue, this is a significant issue, and we know those living with dementia are particularly at risk. So what is elder abuse? In terms of the World Health Organization's definitions, and there are a number of definitions out there, but really using this definition, we know it is defined as single or repeated acts or lack of appropriate action occurring within a relationship where there is an expectation of trust which causes harm or distress to an older person. So that's the official definition or one of the official definitions, but again, it really talks about things that are happening in a relationship where there's an expectation of trust where things are being done that cause harm, or things are being done or not being done, which can cause harm or distress to an older person. So also, I want to take a moment here and just talk a little bit about dementia. Um, and really, this is going to be a full lecture on dementia in two or three slides in particular, but I think this really just gives everybody a basis to be on the same page. Because one of my challenges as a geriatrician is there are a lot of different terms being used. People talk about mild dementia, they talk about Alzheimer's dementia, they talk about mild cognitive impairment, and a lot of these terms get used um, quite commonly in particular. Now the key difference between what is a dementia or what is mild cognitive impairment, well let's start first of all that as we get older, we know that our memory will not be as good as when we were younger. And we have what we call normal age-related memory loss or where we have more of those things that we call seniors moments that may occur. But the key is, if you were to give an older person uh, a memory quiz, for example, if you were to give them a cognitive assessment using a mini mental status examination, a MOCA, or other tests that are out there, they should still score normally, even though they may say subjectively, I have more of those seniors' moments. That's normal age-related memory loss. Now, when a person does actual testing, for example, with a mini mental or a MOCA, and they actually score poorly, for example, so you know that they actually have some problems that are definitely there because of cognitive issues. So let's say, for example, they score 21 out of 30 on a mini mental examination when a normal score would be anything higher than 26. You say, wow, there are some things that are happening here that are, that are below the normal, below the normal range of where you should be, then the key question is, does that, do these cognitive impairments, do these memory impairments that we know exist, do they actually interfere with your ability to do your daily tasks? And if the person says no, then you would say that that's what we call a mild cognitive impairment. It's documented cognitive impairment that does not interfere with one's social or occupational function. That's the piece at the bottom of the slide. But at the top, we talk about dementia being any issues with memory or cognitive impairments 
that are severe enough to interfere with your social or occupational function. That basically means that a person who may now have trouble being able to pay their own bills, take their own medications, or even know how to dress themselves or bathe themselves, for example, because they have cognitive issues in particular. So that's a basic quick summary of how we define normal age-related memory loss versus mild cognitive impairment versus a, an actual dementia. Now we also know that there are different types of dementias out there. We talk about Alzheimer's dementia, we talk about vascular dementia, dementia with Lewy bodies. There's all these different types. In fact, there's up to 100 different classifications or specific classifications of things that can relate to what I just described as a dementia in particular. This lecture is not going to talk about any of that. But really what I want to do is make this very practical. And as a geriatrician, I really don't care so much often about whether this is what exactly is the one of the 100 prototypes, what your dementia is. I want to know how severe this really is affecting your ability to do your tasks. And this is why we often talk about mild, moderate, or severe dementias based on your level of ADL or IEDL impairments. And just to make sure that everyone's on the same page, this is what we talk about, your IEDLs and ADLs at the bottom. ADLs refer to those six basic things we have to do every morning to get ourselves up and going and getting around the house. That's basically transferring from a lying to standing position, it's walking to the bathroom, it's toileting yourself, it's bathing yourself, it's dressing yourself, and then eating something. That's basically what we call your ADLs, your basic activities of daily living. Those are pretty well preserved until that dementia becomes quite severe. And that's where you see significant ADL impairments, making someone almost nursing home eligible, if you will. But your IADLs are your higher order tasks. That's remembering to manage your medications, manage your money, do your shopping, using, you know, using transportation, doing those basic things. And those are the things that we find people start slipping up with at the early stages of dementia. This is why getting people on automatic bill pay or actually helping them take their medications using blister packs or other compliance packaging are ways in which we can help people with mild dementia still lead healthy and active and productive lives in the community, and even still driving to a certain extent as well, um, until things get to more of that moderate level where they may need more supports at home. But it's important to think about this because you can imagine here that if you have problems remembering who people are, what people do, or where your supports are, how to do things, you need to start relying on more people and other people to help you to stay healthy and independent. And this basically, by its nature of dementia, it puts you in a position of vulnerability. And so the question is, who's around and who's at home and who's in your community that can actually help you maintain your independence? And especially if you start having problems remembering where you keep things, you may give passwords, you may be giving permission to other people to do things, and that's a huge element of trust that you're giving to another person, which can set up an easy stage for being a, a potential victim of elder abuse. So I also want to show you my playbook here. This is basically what I teach my trainees to do whenever we diagnose a person with dementia. I'm not talking about medications because often, again, I, you know, I don't really find medications to be terribly helpful for these individuals because there are no medications for dementia that are, that are particularly um, uh, effective at treating or curing. There's no cure for dementia. And often, medications are not disease-modifying. Now, in some people, they may actually help alleviate some of the symptoms, but that's only in one in eight people who actually takes these medications. That's why I really focus on a non-pharmacologic approach, first and foremost, with every one of my patients. We make sure that people understand their diagnosis and prognosis, the fact that this is a neurodegenerative condition that will progress over time. I make sure they know about what resources are out there, like the Alzheimer's Society's First Link program that can connect people to other supports and services, like caregiver education and support programs. I also make sure that I understand who's at home, what are the supports they may need. For example, they may need some supports from uh, the local home care agencies. They also may need help with ways to help them manage their medications, such as compliance packaging. They also, if they're having trouble preparing or getting their own groceries, Meals on Wheels, that's the MOW, or even thinking about programs that can help them socialize safely, such as adult day programs that might also provide some caregiver respite. I also make sure that people get their affairs in order while they still are able to. So make sure they have a will. Do they have a person that they trust who they'd will, willingly place as their power of attorney for finances and personal care? 
because eventually they will not be able to make decisions on their own as the disease progresses. So who do they want to have um, you know, in charge of those important decisions? And do those people understand what their advanced directives are, how they want their money to be spent, and what sort of medical or other interventions do they want, and what sort of places would they like to think about as living options in future if they can no longer make that decision? We always assess uh, fitness to drive. And then, as I just say at the very bottom, I like to make sure that we start goals of care discussions early because a good offense is a great defense. If we get these decisions made and honored at the very beginning, as things progress and become more complicated, at least we know what the playbook that our individual with dementia has basically stated right from the beginning. Okay, so now that we've talked about that primer on dementia, I want to then talk a little bit about the common types of abuse that are, that are out there. So it starts making sense that these are the different types of abuse that are, that are commonly quoted about in the literature. Things like financial abuse, psychological or emotional abuse, physical abuse, sexual abuse, neglect, including self-neglect, and also systemic abuse uh, in particular. And what I really want to focus on here is just a few things. You can imagine that financial abuse is a very common thing. As you forget to be able to manage your finances, that's one of the things that become complicated. You really are trusting another person to basically manage your money for you. And the question is, are they going to manage your finances with your best interests at heart? And this is one of the most common types of abuse that can occur, especially for people living with dementia. A psychological or emotional abuse can be quite common because, again, people with dementia, for example, they may also display things called behavioral and psychological symptoms of dementia. So they may have issues, for example, where they may be more irritable. They may not understand things. And that can be frustrating to a loved one or caregiver um, who may be at home and then say, why are you doing that? Why do you keep asking me these things? And they may not appreciate that it's not that their loved one trying to annoy them. It's just they genuinely can't remember you know, what they asked a few minutes ago. But that sometimes can lead a caregiver to become frustrated, and not necessarily willingly, but this can create stressful situations that can sometimes lead to people being taken advantage of um, and also being abused emotionally, where someone might yell at someone and say, you know, you're useless, you know, why are you keep asking me these questions, and I hate you, I hate you, and all these sorts of things that can make a very precarious situation. Sometimes people can become so frustrated that they may actually take that frustration out in a physical way. Sometimes people take advantage of people who may not know what's going on and may choose to abuse a person in a sexual manner uh, as well. And neglect is an important issue because neglect really speaks to the fact that sometimes a caregiver, and often when you think about caregivers who are often seen in situations where they may be unknowingly cause situations of abuse, and that might be in the position of neglect in terms of they may not be aware that this person needs specific types of care in order to help them to stay independent at home. And sometimes when we actually see a situation of neglect, you know, and we say, oh my goodness, that caregiver is abusing their loved one, Sometimes it's really genuinely innocent where they say, I didn't know. If someone told me that I was supposed to turn my loved one every few hours now that they're bed bound, they wouldn't have gotten a pressure ulcer. Um, and so that's why we talk about neglect sometimes being purposeful neglect when a person says, I'm deliberately not turning my loved one who's bed bound. You know, they can go, you know, I don't really care about them. Well, that's willful neglect. But sometimes there can also be neglect where that individual who's caring for someone may just not have had important care caregiver supports and education to allow them to be the best caregiver they could have been. And sometimes you have older people who are living on their own with dementia who may start self-neglecting. They're not bathing themselves, they're not attending to their own duties, and that this might be because they're unaware. Systemic abuse really refers to the idea that sometimes we have processes or structures in place that may actually cause problems for older adults that might not, for example, give them access to the important information or services they need. Um, and that's an example of systemic abuse where our system almost contributes um, to abuse, uh, abusive situations as well. So this is one of the statements that came back to us when we were developing our senior strategy in Ontario. And you could hear that from one of the respondents. They said, with regards to elder abuse, many older adults suffer in silence, and some do not even know how and where to get help. And I think it speaks to some of the points we were just making in particular. 
So Anne and I prepared some case studies, and what we're going to do is I'm just going to read out the three case studies for you. We're going to repeat them again, and then Anne and I are going to have a conversation around those case studies. These are three cases that we've worked on together, but we just wanted to give you a flavor now that we've given you a primer on dementia and abuse, and then we'll round out some more information and then come back and finish off with some of these cases again. So case study one is a patient that we both know very well. Her name is Mrs. T. She's an 80-year-old woman who's residing with her husband in a downtown Toronto apartment. I started seeing her a number of years ago when she started developing some early stage dementia in particular. But more recently, her care has become incredibly complicated because her dementia has progressed now to a moderate to severe um, stage of vascular dementia. As we said, she's been supported by, in our geriatric medicine clinic here at Mount Sinai. But now her declining dementia is being characterized by significant visual and auditory hallucinations. She believes people are in the, in the house, they're trying to get her, um, and she's also wandering around more and participating in reckless behaviors. For example, she goes to the bank quite often, or she was going to the bank quite often, withdrawing large sums of money and promptly actually losing them as well, and becoming a real person at risk for, uh, for being abused. Um, so we made a referral to the, our community outreach team where Anna is our lead social worker and care navigator. Um, and Mrs. T's uh, spouse, her husband, reported that Mrs. T often would attend that bank to, to take out those large amounts of money. Um, he also, uh, and then the problem was the power of attorney documents were actually left uh, back in India on a recent trip there. So that was really limiting our abilities to really help kind of resolve a situation that was putting both of this couple in a very financial precarious situation. He himself was talking about being very, very stressed as well. Um, and so, and, and, and because of these responsive behaviors that she was having, wandering, um, it was also getting the police quite involved in her care as well. So a really complicated situation in particular. Case study two speaks about Mrs. S, an 82-year-old woman diagnosed with dementia who is residing with her adult son who would assume the role of caregiver um, to Mrs. S with respect to managing her ADLs and some of her IDLs as well, uh, or her IDLs and some of her ADLs. Um, now, Mrs. S.'s son is the designated power of attorney, but the police were contacted following the client's attendance at her adult day program for individuals with cognitive impairment because they actually indicated that her son had physically assaulted her and there was a pattern of abuse consisting of verbal, emotional, and financial abuse. Mrs. S. Mrs. S is a recipient of government-funded personal support worker services as well as social work services through the local community agency. And this is, again, how, um, how you know, again, there were some supports available um, to try and start seeing how we could actually get a more speedy response. Case study number three focuses on Mr. L, an 88-year-old man who is residing with his son and his wife in the same house. Mr. L um, was sponsored by his son from Russia to immigrate to Canada. Mr. L was diagnosed with dementia a few years ago and was provided with instructions from the client's son and wife, however, not to interact now with other family members at the residence, mainly because his behaviors were sometimes inappropriate and the family members were embarrassed by his behaviors. So they started saying, you can't talk to other family members when they come over and visit, and you're not allowed to go into the other rooms where they may be. You've got to stay here and don't talk to anybody else but us. So this is becoming a really challenging situation for him. And it basically came to the attention of a local personal support worker that comes to give him a bath twice a week because he was really upset by these aspects. So he was really expressing how he was experiencing social isolation and symptoms related to depression and anxiety because he felt he was a prisoner in his own house and wasn't able to interact with family members that he really cared about as well. So the question is, you know, we're giving you some examples of who is at risk when it comes to issues of dementia um, and abuse. And you can start seeing here that there's some common themes already that we've been highlighting in some of the case studies that Anna and I have put together. Number one is, you know, the fact of the matter is you can be marginalized, the marginalization of an individual elder or abuser, um, poverty, social isolation, frailty or impairment. So the idea that if you might be too physically frail, you might not be able to get out of the house, but cognitively if you're frail, you may not be able to get out of the house much e easier. Women tend to be at greater risk than men. Also, if there's been a previous history of abuse that's occurred, you may be at an increased risk of abuse in, fu in future. 
if you're always dependent on someone else, you're at higher risk of being abused by that person. And also, substance abuse can also put people at a higher risk of, of being abused as well. So a number of different factors that you can imagine that can put someone being dependent on other people uh, and make sure that they are at higher risk of abuse. When we talk about abuser characteristics, um, again, these can be some of the factors that can lead. So for example, you know, I have a number of patients, for example, who are living with a family member who's become their caregiver. And because caregiving can become all-encompassing, a 24-7 activity, it may mean that they're now socially isolated from everybody else. And sometimes that can breed resentment. You know, my life has been stolen because now I have to care for you all day long. And you can imagine, you can just hear the aggravation in my voice there that can lead to emotional issues as well. Stress can also impact in other aspects of the abuser's life as well. If they're financially dependent now or if they're stressed, for example, for example, because now they have to stay home more often, they have to miss more work, then their finances are being stretched and that can be problematic for them. Um, sometimes there's that need for control. They need to control everything that's happening because caring for a loved one with dementia can be often very confusing and challenging, especially when they may be wandering, they may be, it may be troublesome trying to control the situation when dementia is a hard issue to control to begin with. Substance abuse, you know, if the caregiver has a substance abuse issue, alcohol dependence or other things, that can actually increase the risk that they may then want to steal money from their loved one, or they may actually be put in situations where they may actually become violent or challenged in terms of how they look after their loved one. A lack of caregiving knowledge, I gave that example before, or experience, may mean that people may unwittingly do things that may actually put their loved one at harm. And again, confusion of dementia, of the abuser. Um, so I think that really refers to the fact that, um, you know, if the person, you know, the abuser itself may actually have cognitive impairments, that might actually create situations where they may actually um, be at, at a greater likelihood of creating neglectful situations or abuse, abusive situations as well. So the familial caregiving elements we talked about show that research studies and case studies reported to the criminal justice system have found that family members are all, most often the abusers. And I think we've given a number of examples of why that might actually be. Caregiver stresses combined with external stressors such as a lack of those social supports for either person, the abuser or the abused, can lead to potentially abusive situations. In interdependency between elders and families, significant others and abusers um, can often uh, make things particularly challenging. And behavior may also vary according to one's family or cultural background. And we always have to take that into account about social norms, for example, what's seen as acceptable, what's not seen as acceptable, and how that can sometimes be interpreted as an abusive situation or potentially abusive situation where there may be specific family or cultural norms depending on, on your ethnocultural background as well. So always something important to understand those ethnocultural aspects as well. We also know that those underlying risks can be at play. Those power imbalances and societal stereotypical attitudes about older people can often have an unrecognized effect on the views, actions, and inactions of caregivers, family, or significant other members, and eventually even the elders living with the abuse themselves. Imbalance such as ageist and sexist values also in society and within an organization providing service can create an environment in which elder abuse is tolerated by the society as well. So how do we make sure that we understand these other aspects that might actually contribute towards a challenging situation? So in terms of identifying signs of abuse, we've put together a few of these aspects here in particular. When it comes to financial abuse, again, this could be sudden changes in banking practices, large unexplained withdrawals by a person accompanying the elder, unauthorized withdrawals of funds using an ATM card. Right? The elder might say, you can take out money for me. They sometimes say this to their personal support workers. Can you please just get me $10 for the day? But that person might get them $10 and get themselves $100, for example, without letting the, the abuse, abused actually know what they're actually doing. Abrupt changes in the wills or financial documents. I can tell you, ladies and gentlemen, I've seen all sorts of funny business happen where her people all of a sudden get people to scrawl something on a form and now say that they're the now power of the attorney. They get all the funding, and it's been put in really challenging situations uh, that become complicated. 
emotional abuse is often, you know, some of the signs are being, you know, like our last person, Mr. L, being emotionally upset or agitated, withdrawn or non-communicative. His personal support worker said, what's going on? Why are you so sad? And then he shared a really private situation that was happening with his family that was making him feel depressed. He felt intimidated or afraid of the family members because, again, he was dependent on them because without their support, he might get kicked out of the house. When we think about physical abuse, for example, we look for bruises, burns, welts, elders reporting being hit or unexplained injuries that don't quite make sense, or a caregiver's refusal to let visitors see an elder alone. Don't examine them. Don't look at them. Don't come into the house. They don't want to see you. Sexual abuse might be bruises around the chest or genital area, for example. This is something that personal support workers in our organizations may tend to see if they're bathing and say, what's going on? Torn, stained, or bloody underclothes, elders reports of sexual assault, for example. And these things, while not super common, they do happen, so we have to keep our eyes and ears open. Also, we talked a little bit about examples before of neglect or self-neglect, dehydration, poor nutrition, poor hot personal hygiene, if they're living with someone, why are they, you know, covered in urine? Why do they smell so badly? You know, why aren't they taking? And sometimes, you know, I'll see a situation where this is how an older person presents to my clinic. But, you know, we also appreciate that sometimes I have elders who refuse to change their clothes. And it's not due to a lack of trying. So, again, these situations can sometimes be ones where we jump to conclusions easily. But it's why we have to understand what's going on and what's, you know, what's really at play here. Systemic abuse, and again, we talked a little bit about this prejudicial attitudes towards older people or elders are denied access to certain services due to institutional practices or policies. So when it comes to assessment intervention, here's some quick tips. Ageism is multifaceted and it manifests itself in multiple ways. And while there's been work undertaken in Canada and internationally to address ageism, it still appears to be very much present in our healthcare system and is treated less seriously than other forms of discrimination based on issues of ethnocultural issues or sexual discrimination um, in, in those ways. Elder abuse is also more complicated than child abuse. For example, that we know children up until the age of 18, they don't necessarily have, you know, authority to make their own decisions. That is always relegated to their parent or guardian. But for older adults, for example, they are never necessarily under the guardianship of another unless that's officially actually warranted. And this is the challenge, that if a person, um, you know, if a person um, is having bad things happen to them, but they're capable of allowing bad things happen to them, and they're allowing to that to be permitted, they're actually allowed, they're legally entitled to allow bad things to happen to them if they are capable of supporting that to happen. That's why it becomes very complicated, because sometimes they'll say, well, that's terrible. You know, you're being abused. We should charge people. But they may actually be permissive if they're capable, and we have to understand why this becomes much more complicated than, say, ch child abuse, which may be a little bit more straightforward from that aspect of capacity and capability to sometimes permit and allow abuse to occur. As older uh, Ontario populations ages, again, the potential exists that elder abuse will increase unless it's more comprehensively recognized and addressed. So is elder abuse a crime? Well, there's no specific crime of elder abuse. How many forms of elder abuse that we've described um, may be a crime under the criminal code? And you get a whole listing of these aspects here, uh, which again can show how many of the things we talked about can find a home in the criminal code as specific um, crimes or acts against an older person in particular. So what can you do if you actually suspect elder abuse? Well, recognize the signs of abuse, ask, and then report and refer. And we'll give you some quick examples, and then we'll jump into our case studies. So abuse is common and it can be stopped. Clients who are stressed, confused, elderly, or requiring assistance with movement are most often at being risked for being abused. Most clients know their abusers moderately well. Only 47% of nurses in the community who witnessed abuse tried to stop it, but 89% of the staff who actually try and stop abuse or reduce it are successful. And even if we can't stop abuse, we can certainly improve things for an older adult in particular. So what you can do, well, listen to older adults and others who may tell you about suspicions of abuse. Keep your eyes open as well, and do not discount an older person's claim simply because of a cognitive impairment. Sometimes they, you know, I have, I have patients of mine who will joke and say, ah, my wife beats me up all the time. 
But I kind of look and say, okay, well, you know, are they joking? Or are they not joking? I take every comment seriously um, in particular. Um, and sometimes they're joking because that's just their personality. But sometimes you have to make sure that we're kind of making sure that if they say something, is there some substance behind that? And, and how do we make sure that's important? And sometimes you'll say, sometimes the caregiver will say, ah, they say that all the time, but you know they're demented. They don't know what they're talking about. But always remember, if someone makes a comment, there may be something behind that. And make sure you just keep your eyes and ears open. Look for elder abuse indicators and behavior changes. And ask questions, even if you do not suspect abuse, to encourage disclosure. So one thing I do in my practice is I always make sure I ask all of my patients do you feel safe in your current situation? It's a real simple question, and imagine when you ask that question, you get all sorts of responses back, ladies and gentlemen. So how to ask? Well, interviews should be conducted privately. It should take the form of dialogue whenever possible, and especially if I suspect the situation, I always find opportunities to get that older person alone for a moment or two. I might even say to the caregiver, could you go in, uh, and get those pills for me? And I use those opportunities when we're alone to actually ask that person something as well. I sometimes tack it on to the cognitive testing because I sometimes say to the caregiver, can I have you out of the room so I can simply do that? And while I'm doing the cognitive testing, I might tack on a few questions privately saying, can you just tell me, by the way, do you feel safe? And that way I create an opportunity for them to share with me. I also make questions routine and part of the interview. I ask it in questionnaires, but I also make sure I ask it, you know, um, obviously in person as well. And I try and document answers meticulously using interviewees' own words whenever possible, as opposed to passing my own value judgments as well. In terms of reporting elder abuse, if the situation is an emergency and you believe that the person for whom you're concerned is at risk, always call 911 and get the emergency services involved. In a growing number of organizations, um, there may be a key contact person in place who you can respond and refer. So in Anna's organization, which is a large community support services agency, we know that if we identify people in that organization, they can certainly con communicate with the team social workers as well, who can then help navigate situations. At Mount Sinai Hospital, we've got 5,000 staff, but we all know now if we have an individual that we're concerned about, um, you know, maybe the victim abuse, and I'm not really sure what to do, I know that I can contact my social work team or my nursing team, and we have a designated lead nurse and social worker who basically are key contacts for the organization and help navigate and support us in moving things forward. Um, this is more specific to Ontario, but if the older adult does not have the capacity to understand their situation, you can often get involved the Office of the Public Guardian and Trustee, and they can often conduct an investigation and always document answers meticulously using interviewees' own words whenever possible. But if you're not sure who to call in a non-urgent situation, try and see if there's a social work colleague who you can get involved because sometimes they can be the best point of contact, and that's why Anna's on the webinar with us today. So remember talking about that essential management dementias. Remember all those things I talked about that are highlighted in red. You can see how all of this is putting a good plan in place to help limit the risks of potential abuse in future as well and why it's so important. Okay, so let's get back into our case studies um, and then we'll get into your questions as well. So you remember the case study number one. This is the case of Mrs. T. Again, she's living with her husband in a downtown Toronto apartment. She's the one with the severe vascular dementia. She's got a lot of behavioral issues, visual and auditory hallucinations. She's also been taking a lot of money out of the bank. Um, and this has been really challenging financially for Mr. T, who is the power of attorney, but left the POA documents in India, which is making things really difficult for him to sort, sort things out with the bank uh, and then things. So Anna is here with me now. And Anna, what did we do? So thank you. So in terms of an intervention, uh, the initial referral uh, started with uh, a gem nurse from a local hospital here in Toronto. And then a sub subsequent referral was made to the Independence at Home Community Outreach Team. So our CCAC care, care coordinator went out to conduct a home visit. And um, there was a discussion about a long-term care application being initiated. Um, also, PSW services were implemented uh, with respect to the client and to provide uh, some respite relief to the spouse. Um, a suggestion was also made uh, for a wandering bracelet. This is a client who has a tendency to wander in the community, which puts her safety at risk. Um, there was also a contact with the Ad Advocacy Center for the Elderly where some very good suggestions were made. 
uh, one being a certificate of incapability. Um, and then in terms of my role, I accompanied the client's spouse to the bank where we had a meeting with the bank manager who was quite helpful. Um, so there was just a redistribution of funds and that seems to be a non-issue at this time. And then luckily that power of attorney that was executed in, uh, that was executed in India um, found its way here via mail. And I think, I think Anna is underplaying a little bit of the role here because this is a patient that when the wheels were starting to fall off the bus, for example, we had a real devoted caregiver, Mr. T, who was really expressing a lot of caregiver distress and he said, I don't know if I can do this anymore. So by having our, our, our outreach team that, again, it's an interprofessional team, get involved, they were able to kind of assess and say, let's get some personal support worker services in just to help with some of the caring needs, for example. Anna was able to get in touch with our local legal aid clinic who actually were able to teach me about a form. And then Anna was able to contact me and said, Dr. Sinha, what you need to do is you need to write this very specific email that will actually be sent to the bank manager to you know, just give them the minimal amount of information they need to know to do their fiduciary responsibility of protecting uh, you know, their clients' access to their own funds and to support their well-being. And also by getting me a special Government of Canada form that actually could allow me not having to do a formal financial capacity assessment, but assessing that you know, this person does have dementia, is having trouble um, uh, managing their funds, um, then we were able to make sure that the funds can now be better controlled by her spouse who wants to better support uh, their collective needs. Um, and I think this is where we were able to kind of better support both the us in the situation so that while Mrs. T was not specifically being abused, she was at a high risk of being abused. And here we were able to create a much more safer situation while she now waits for a nursing home bed uh, in future, which will be a most appropriate setting for her um, in future as her care needs have increased. In terms of case number number two, again, this is the story of Mrs. S, our 82-year-old woman, who, um, and she's living with someone who's the designated power of attorney, who is basically helping her with her, per, uh, with her ADLs and her IDLs. But again, this is where the police were contacted because there were significant concerns the son was physically assaulting her and also, uh, you know, contributing to verbal, emotional, and financial abuse. And again, she's the recipient of some personal support worker services. But this is where, again, our social work colleagues were able to help us out through a local community agency. So Anna, what were some of the things that we did here? So in uh, terms of our role, some of the interventions that we engaged, a uh, police community relations officer um, was contacted and in turn a no contact order was issued. So the client's son was required to leave the home. So at this time the client uh, continued to re reside alone, but because of uh, cognitive issues, there were some concerns in terms of uh, execution of her IADLs and ADLs. So the uh, Community Care Access Center was very helpful in increasing her PSW support at home and at her adult day program. So this is a client who went to an adult day program uh, with clients with cognitive impairment, uh, pretty much on a full-time basis, Monday to Friday, and was there for the entire duration of the day. And then following her return home, so transportation was also arranged with the specific adult day program. There was some PSW support in the evening time because again, she was uh, residing alone. And with this specific, specific client, there were very few familiar supports living in Toronto. Um, a coordinated care plan or a case plan did okay. occur with the police. We had a lawyer from ACE, the Advocacy Center for the Elderly, uh, who was also present along with the community relations officer and um, she was found incapable of managing her own finances and a ref referral was made to the Office of the Public Guardian Trustee who assumed um, just responsibility of managing her finances. Uh, the Treatment Decisions Unit was also contacted at OPGT and a long-term care application was completed by the CCAC. The CCAC care coordinator was also um, very involved in our case conferences and she was eventually admitted to long-term care, long-term care of her choice at Baycrest Hospital. And uh, I think just with, re with respect to the coordinated care plan, I think it was a very successful resolution um, because this was a client who wanted to be admitted to long-term care as well. So just different people coming together um, in the best interest of the specific client. 
And I think, you know, and I think, you know, th you know, from what I learned from this situation in particular was here is an individual who was being abused, who didn't want to be abused, and really didn't want to be living with her son anymore because I think that trust and that support had been violated. So she was really seeking help. And I think this is a great example of where this is what the person wanted. And so by getting the right care around that person, we were able to remove the abuser from the situation because this was the desire of the older person themselves. We were able then to wrap more services such as day program support, personal support around there to really keep them safe at home, make sure their basic care needs were being attended to, figure out an, a, a new living situation, which is what they wanted to be in a long-term care home, for example, and then making sure that we got the legal pieces revoking the power of attorney, the son's ability to control her finances and personal care, and then making sure that because we had nobody else to put in place, that we now had the Ontario government in this place through the public guardian and trustee could take over that role for her until a new appropriate power of attorney could be identified and designated. And then I just wanted to add, with respect to this client, a, the OPGT arranged for a capacity assessor to visit with the client. I was present as well at her adult day program. And uh, the OPGT, because of very limited funds with respect to this client, they were able to absorb that specific cost, which I don't think they do on a regular basis, uh, but they really needed that capacity assessment to go forward. Perfect. The next one is case study three. Again, this is Mr. L. This is the gentleman who's living with his son and his son's wife in the same house. He's the one who's immigrated from Russia, and basically, as his dementia has been progressing, he's been having some more behavioral issues. The son and the wife are really restricting his ability to talk to other family members and even go to other rooms in the house, and he really is feeling now that he's in a situation where you know, he's feeling more, much more isolated in his own house I um, mean, he's experiencing more social isolation, and he's concerned about this in particular. So in this case, it's slightly different because here's an individual, for example, who doesn't necessarily want to leave the home. He wants to be in the home, but he's also not happy with how the situation is occurring. So Anna, what do we do in this situation? Thank you. So what we did with this specific client was we contacted uh, Family Service Toronto and arranged for an elder abuse uh, consultation with their elder abuse consultation team with Lisa Manuel. Um, like uh, Dr. Sin has stated, this was a client who very much wanted to live at home and was very confused after immigrating from Russia to Canada. Um, so a suggestion for him to go to uh, a shelter, a senior shelter in Toronto, Pass Place, was made to him, uh, which is affiliated with Family Service Toronto, but he declined this option, wishing to stay at home. The uh, CCAC care coordinator, uh, he had a, obviously an active file with CCAC, um, approved an increase in PSW services really to act as uh, a monitoring uh, and just to ensure that, you know, while he remained there, that uh, things were being monitored. An application uh, was made to uh, housing connections in Toronto, and he was actually approved for priority subsidized housing. That actually took only a couple of months, but I know in some situations uh, with elder abuse or priority subsidized housing, applications can take much longer. And so this also talks about some of the subtleties, for example, when working with people who um, who are being abused because sometimes we say, wow, we should just get you out of the house immediately because you're being abused. And some people say, you know what, look, you know, I know this is not an ideal situation, but sometimes I'd rather be in a home with a loved one in a less ideal situation than actually being in a nursing home or retirement home. And so this is where it gets complicated. And I think this is where it's important to understand what is the person's capability? Do they understand the choices that they're making? Do they have the capacity to make those decisions? And then it's how do we respect and support them to try and alleviate the situation. And in many of these cases where he wants to stay in the home for a time being, not go to the shelter, for example, that was his choice. We were able to honor that choice, but also create a more longer-term situation that he and the family would have been happy with as well. And I think this is why I, these, these are some of the strategies that we came up with in this case. So again, this is our time to lead and remember that there are things you can do. You can recognize the signs of elder abuse, ask the person you're concerned about if they are being abused, and ask for help if you 
Ask for help if you need help to help the person of concern. Uh, <laughs> sorry about that. That was a late night typing error. And report or refer whenever possible to ensure help can be arranged to stop or at least reduce the abuse from occurring in future. So now we have time for some question and So another question, oh, and actually before I do that, I just wanted to, uh, you're all uh, taking part and that's wonderful to see, but for those who haven't seen this type of poll question before, I do invite you to take part in the polls as we're going through these Q&As. And that just helps guide us on um, our next webinars and, and future webinar events. Uh, so please continue to do so. I think there's about a total of six questions to, um, to go through, and uh, we'll um, do that while we're going through the Q&A. So next question. Uh, thank you. I am a community health nurse in Nunavut, and now uh, the Northwest Territories where elder abuse is very prevalent. I know that you are developing a national senior strategy. Are the seniors or elders in Nunavut and the Northwest Territories part of this strategy? Are you aware of the services available in northern Canada? There is widespread elder abuse here in the north, financially, physically, psychologically, and neglect. And at present, there is no protection for the elderly in certain parts of the Northwest Territories. Children are protected by health services, child health services, but there is nothing in place for the elders. If the elders do not report abuse, the local RCMP will not intervene, and culturally, the elders do not complain. They are therefore very vulnerable, and this lack of support is very frustrating to those of us who are aware of the abuse and have nowhere to go. Absolutely. And so as I was working in Ontario and as I've been continuing some of this work more nationally, I'm very familiar. My first clinical experiences were actually based for two years in a northern Manitoba First Nations community. And I currently am the lead geriatrician for a program supporting our most isolated communities on the James Bay Coast out of Wapiscat and Moose Factory and those being some of them, for example, a collection of communities. So I'm very familiar with the challenges, especially in our First Nations communities, but also, um, you know, but for other ethnocultural communities as well. You're right, you know, in a few points. The problem is we don't actually have adult protective services available in a uniform way across the country, for example. There are some provinces, especially on the East Coast, where they do have adult protective services. I don't know if they extend into um, the reach of being able to support people living in First Nations communities. But the key is it's particularly challenging because if you are an elder in a community and you're very vulnerable and you need to rely on other people, you know, there's even more reasons why um, you can be prone to being vulnerable, especially if there's higher incidences of poverty or other things that might put one at risk and making them more dependent on others. Um, the key, my key strategy in terms of the communities that I engage and work in is trying to make sure that, you know, one of the reasons why I think abuse can be more prevalent, for example, can sometimes be, you know, because we have caregivers who are stressed, who are not um, being supported as well as they could. So what are the things that we can do to try and alleviate some of those things that could lead to um, elder abuse? Yeah, every community is different in terms of the resources it has available or the capacities that it has. I've seen some First Nations communities that have created really good um, infrastructures, others that still have a lot of work to do. But the key is we try and look in each of these situations as to, is there a caregiver in distress? What can we do to support them with additional services? Um, is there you know, a situation where we can actually relocate this elder? And in some cases, what we've done with the support of the elder themselves is we've actually chosen them to move them out of their communities into a safer situation. And so really we try to really try and see what are the resources at hand, because every situation is different, to try and really support that individual as well. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Uh, another question coming in, it's challenging to work with families where the person with dementia's behaviors escalate to be abusive towards their caregivers, often seen with uh, frontotemporal dementia clients. Issues of abuse are also complicated when there's some previous domestic violence in the home by the person who now has dementia and that behavior is continuing and the caregiver is suffering from the lifetime of abuse and additional guilt. Care to comment on that, either uh, Anna or uh, Samir? I mean, this is, a, this is a big challenge because I think, you know, again, you know, if, you know, if an abuser, for example, if I got the question correct, you know, if the abuser, for example, um, now develops dementia, the question is what does that dementia, compl you know, contribute? And, you know, this is a challenge. You know, sometimes previous behaviors can be unmasked. Previous tendencies can be unmasked. And especially if that person has underlying personality issues as well, that can make things incredibly challenging and difficult for caregivers. And I think the key is, you know, just because the person has dementia doesn't mean that they're automatically going to be the person who can be abused. 
sometimes with frontal temporal dementia, they can inadvertently and unknowingly and maybe unwillingly actually become an abuser in their own right, where they may be kicking and punching and beating. They may actually start being expressing some of those behaviors themselves. And again, ironically, in, in that way, this person who's vulnerable in their own right might actually become an abuser um, in that way. And I think this is the key concern is how do we then identify who is being abused, whether it be the caregiver in this case, for example, um, and then how do we try and minimize the situations or better alleviate that? And sometimes this might mean that we actually have to separate individuals um, if that may, be, may be actually be the best solution forward, or are there other things we can do to try and minimize that distress? For example, if the if the you know if the person with dementia might become very physically aggressive and abusive, for example, to their loved ones, especially around the time of bathing, what I have done at times is brought in a third party, like a personal support worker, who's less likely to elicit you know um, those sorts of responses because that's an unfamiliar person that the first the person with dementia feels they can actually actively abuse. So I try and be creative as best as possible in these situations, but remember, it doesn't really matter if the person has dementia or not, or it's if they're the caregiver or the care recipient. The key is if someone is being abused, how do we look at the situation and try and alleviate suffering in that way? And I, I just wanted to add, just from uh, previous experience, uh, contacting the police in your local area, um, so community relations officers, uh, they're generally quite helpful in uh, just, just providing some advocacy or strategies. Um, and then there's also Legal Aid Ontario sometimes if it has to go uh, through that route as well. And then most uh, courthouses in Toronto have family law information centers where people can go to get some advice as well. But usually uh, for me the initial point of contact uh, has been to call Toronto Police and they're usually able to help with some navigation. Thank you, and I think that's good advice. Okay, so I know that we are over time, so I'm going to, unfortunately, there's some uh, great questions in here, and, it, and it's so tough to, to choose. Um, just a, a couple of practical questions. Um, the government form uh, that you used um, for Mrs. T to provide to the bank, do you recall that? Yeah, it's what that called was? Uh, Certificate of in incapability, incapability Through Service in Canada. So really what this can result is uh, the individual's old age security and CPP government entitlements to be transferred to um, usually the spouse. And again, that's the Certificate of Incapability through Service Canada. You can find it on their website. I have to say, I had no clue about this form until Anna, our amazing social worker, educated about this to me a few months ago. This thing is a godsend, especially if there's uh, not, uh, uh, if you can't get a financial capacity assessment done. It allows even social workers, doctors, any healthcare professional who can say that I believe this person doesn't have the capacity to manage their own finance, doesn't give you control of that. It just allows a spouse or a partner, um, I believe, to then help manage those finances on their behalf or go their government entitlements to protect their needs. So again, it's the Certificate of Incapability. It'll become your best friend, um, and it's a Service Canada form. Wonderful, thank you. And I know we're two minutes over, but I'm going to try to squeeze in one last question. I hope that's okay. Um, and I think this is an interesting one. As a community nurse, caregivers are the gatekeepers to the home. What can I do if there is neglect and the caregiver cancels CCAC services? My hands are then tied. If the older adult is not at imminent risk, what can I do? You know, I think the key is, you know, this is a, a classic situation where sometimes we've got the caregiver who doesn't understand the situation, um, you know, and the, the caregiver sometimes might actually have to mention themselves. We had a big case recently where the, you know, the person who was at greater risk was being cared for by their brother at home, and, and this is a couple in their 80s, if you will, well, not a couple, but you know, brother and sister pair. The sister was very demented and needed a lot of help. The brother was the primary caregiver, but as his dementia progressed, he was no longer willing to let people in and help out with the family. And it became a situation where it, the home was no longer a safe situation, but he wasn't really allowing us to go in the home. So this is where we actually contacted the local police. We let them know about the situation because at the end point when we realized we need to get access to the home and enough coaxing and by everybody trying to be nice, at one point we said now the safety of this individual is that concern. 
So working with the police, we were able to not call 911 and have lights and sirens and everything, but we were able to engage a community police officer who in a very non-threatening way and has the right, if you will, to say, I really do need to enter the home. We also have community paramedics here in the GTA now who we're able to, because sometimes people won't answer the door to a lovely social worker or a lovely geriatrician, but they will open the door to someone in uniform who can then just get a foothold in the door, try and evaluate safety and try and figure things out. So again, use the community police resources you have. Calling proactively, which we did three days in advance in terms of our planned intervention, elicited a great response because frankly, everybody basically is going to get involved. How do we actually support this person to do this in a non-threatening way, especially when people are now blocking care to a person, which is potentially putting their actual, that individual's care at risk. Thank you for that. Okay, I know that we're over and I've pushed everyone to the limit, so I think we'll have to end <laughs> it there. Um, I do want to uh, thank our presenters very much for their time, both today and in preparation of today's event. So Dr. Sinha and Anna, thank you so, so much. Um, the questions and the comments that were provided by you, the participants, I know I say this all the time, but it really makes for a successful webinar to get your involvement. So thank you for, for that interaction. Um, I will just make one more plug for an upcoming event that we have on July 13th, and that is featuring Dr. Pat Armstrong, and that webinar is entitled Reimagining Long-Term Residential Care, Ideas Worth Sharing. So I do encourage you all to take part in that, and registration will open within the next week or two. Um, any final words from our two presenters before we head off for this afternoon? No. No, 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 not no. at all. I think we're good. Okay. Well, thank you again very much for your time, and, and everyone, thank you for joining us. And uh, we'll reconvene again in a month's time. Thanks so much, everyone. Take care.